Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to ASPE's uh, International Conference on the Future Submarine. I'm Ben Schreer, Senior Analyst from ASPE. I'll be your MC for the next two days. Um, mm -hmm. Without further ado, I the floor to the Chairman. Um, would you please welcome Mr. Stephen Newsley. Well, thank you, Ben. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome everyone this morning to ASPE's 2014 International Conference on the Submarine Choice. This is a great strategic decision which Australia is shortly to take. ASPE is very pleased to be able to assemble such a distinguished group of strategic leaders and thinkers and experts in their fields, both from Australia and from overseas. And we're grateful to people for taking the time from busy schedules and cramped diaries, and in some instances for travelling great distances to attend this conference here in Canberra today. Your attendance signals that the conference couldn't be more timely or more important. Ladies and gentlemen, the future submarine program could well become the most complex, the most significant, and indeed the most expensive military platform ever built in this country. It is a program of very great consequence, possibly the most significant acquisition program since the Royal Australian Navy was founded in 1913. This means there are major challenges, major opportunities. There are risks for government, for the ADF, for industry. This program will last several decades, for at least 30 years. It will involve opportunity costs of tens of billions of dollars and many years of skilled application and effort. And the program will send clear and unambiguous messages to our allies, to our friends and partners, and indeed to potential adversaries of Australia's strategic intentions and our strategic capability in a changing Indo-Pacific region. That's why government, defence and industry need to get the decisions right. That's why we need to have a robust and comprehensive debate about the submarine choice to assist government to think through this highly complex issue. And that's of course why we're gathered here today. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Chairman of ASPE, I'm very proud to be able to say without fear of contradiction that we act always as an independent, non-partisan think tank with a mission to produce expert and timely advice for Australia's strategic leaders and we're ideally placed to facilitate this process on the submarine choice and to canvas ideas over the next couple of days. The fact that the Defence Minister, Senator David Johnson, has chosen the conference to share some key insights into the government's thinking on the future submarine is an acknowledgement of ASPE's significant role in the Australian strategic and defence community and the defence debate. Ladies and gentlemen, our aim over the next two days is to have an always frank, perhaps controversial, but unfailingly constructive debate about some of the key strategic, economic and industrial questions related to the future Australian submarine. Some of these questions include where do our submarines need to operate and how does that fit within a wider national security strategy? What do our allies and partners expect Australia's submarines to be able to do? How many operationally deployable submarines do we need? I endeavour to shed some light on that a day or so in an op-ed piece. What type of submarine makes most sense strategically and economically? Does it make sense to build them in Australia or are we better off taking a boat from off the shelf. What is needed for Australian industry to deliver? What are the partnerships required? What can Australia learn from the past and from experiences abroad? Ladies and gentlemen, as everyone in this room is aware, there are no ready answers. There are certainly no easy answers to any of these questions. But it's hoped that we can canvas ideas and throw more light on them in order to inform Australian government thinking. I will conclude my remarks 
by thanking our sponsors, Lockheed Martin and Talis, where I serve as an advisory board director, Northrop Grumman, Thyssen Krupp Marine Systems and Raytheon. We thank them for their valuable support for this conference. We greatly appreciate it, we value it and we cannot complete our mission without such support. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, a very warm welcome to ASPE's 2014 Submarine Conference. May everyone find it productive and stimulating and rewarding, but above all, enjoyable. Ladies and gentlemen, could I now invite our Executive Director, Peter Jennings, to the lectern. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this ASPE conference on Australia's submarine choice. Um, I thought this morning, by way of uh, a warm-up act uh, for the Minister, I'd spend a little bit of time uh, setting out the reasons why ASPE decided to undertake uh, this uh, particular topic. Uh, and then I want to offer uh, what I've described as some rules of thumb for making decisions about submarine acquisitions. Now this does reflect uh, something of a departure for us in terms of the topics that ASPE has chosen for conferences in the past. We have typically produced uh, conferences on broad themes about uh, international and in particular Asia Pacific security issues. And while that's an abiding research interest for us, this conference in many ways returns us to core business that is the systematic and careful analysis of strategy and force structure decision making uh, uh, supported by a close understanding of budget realities. And our interest in hosting a conference at this time is simply uh, to do what we can to inform government thinking about our broader and, and a broader national understanding about the submarine choice. I want to go back to the defence policy statement which the Coalition made uh, shortly before the September 19, uh, uh, 2013 election. Uh, and this is what it said about submarines. The Coalition will ensure Australia's Collins class submarine force has its rightful place as a regionally superior conventional submarine capability. Any substantial decision making on defence acquisition including in relation to our submarine fleet and capabilities can responsibly only be made with the advice of the Chief of Defence Force and Service Chiefs. However, we will make the decisions necessary to ensure that Australia has no submarine capability gap within 18 months of the election. Uh, and finally, it says we will also ensure that the work on the replacement of the current submarine fleet will centre on the South Australian shipyards. Now, looking in detail uh, at that uh, statement, I think it shows a number of important considerations are in play. First, there's a judgment about capability that the future submarine will be a regionally superior conventional capability. Second, there's a judgment about the necessary time frame for making decisions within 18 months of the election to avoid a, a capability gap. And finally, there's a judgment about industrial capability that the work will centre on the South Australian shipyards. Now, in broad terms, these dispositions have remained part of the government's thinking since the election. And to stay on track in terms of timing, what that clearly means is that a lot of hard government thinking is necessary about options uh, this year, in particular after the budget. Now, ASPE suggested in uh, as far back as uh, early 2012 that the total cost of the submarine replacement program, based on cost trend data, would be in the order of 36 billion dollars. And nothing we've seen since that time causes us to think that this was an overestimate. Of course, if you think of the through life capability of the submarine, the figure is considerably larger. So this is no ordinary decision. The submarine choice will be one of the biggest and most consequential defence capability decisions taken by an Australian government. And indeed, in terms of dollars, one of the most uh, uh, substantial public policy decisions. So in gathering our speakers at this conference and welcoming all of you today, I, uh, I, we um, suggest that we've assembled perhaps the most knowledgeable gathering ever held in Australia about matters to do with submarines. 
with many of the key players in Australian decision making, starting with the Defence Minister, David Johnson. Uh, we have senior representatives from the navies of key allies and friends, uh, senior representatives including Chief of Navy from our own Navy. Um, we have a who's who of international industry. Um, and as my chairman did, I encourage you all to participate actively, to share knowledge and to help us move the debate in the right directions for Australia's interests. Now, before we hear from the Minister, I want to set out what I believe are the necessary approaches which government will need to apply as it starts to make the submarine choice. These are guideposts to help us make sure we get the decision right. Um, think of them as the uh, Jennings rule of thumb. Now, uh, there are some people here for whom uh, English is not their first uh, language, so perhaps I should explain that the term rule of thumb refers to a principle that has broad application. It may not be strictly accurate in every situation, but it's an easily applied procedure to assist in decision making. If I was um, an ANU academic, I would call these the Jennings heuristics. Um, but people say I'm all thumbs, so uh, you have eight rules of thumb uh, to assist in the submarine choice. First rule of thumb I, I would suggest is that government's consideration of the submarine choice should be led by strategy. Now it turns out that we're not living in the relatively benign world that was anticipated in the 2012 Asian Century White Paper or the 2013 National Security Strategy. The use of hard-edged military power has resurfaced in Europe of all places, never really went away in the Middle East and much of Africa. In Asia, we see a worrying pattern of military strategic competition over disputed territories. North Korea is a continuing challenge, and regional security architecture is underdeveloped and unlikely to be able to moderate in a regional crisis. The International Institute of Strategic Studies in London points out that in real terms, Asian defence spending in 2013 was 11.6% higher than in 2010, and much of this expenditure was devoted to strengthening maritime systems. This was, of course, a period when uh, defence uh, spending cuts and deferrals of a significant nature were applied in Australia. So I think a key policy challenge for the government here is to understand the mix of risks and opportunities um, this strategic situation uh, presents us. It's by no means all downside. Uh, indeed, there are good opportunities for growth and opportunities for cooperation remain strong. But this isn't a, a time, I would suggest, for uh, retrenching significant defence capabilities. And that is actually something that both our government and the opposition recognise uh, through their commitment to lifting defence spending over the coming decade to around 2% of gross national product. Now speaking in Adelaide recently, uh, just before the state's election, the Prime Minister also stressed the importance of strategy-led defence planning. And I think his quote is useful for our deliberations. We make defence decisions, he said, on the basis of defence imperatives not on the basis of industry assistance imperatives or regional assistance imperatives. Now that's a welcome comment. People in this room will understand that it does run slightly counter to much of the public debate on the submarine choice, but it's absolutely the right starting point. My second suggested rule of thumb is that the government should look hard at what roles and missions it wants the submarines to perform. Now, of course, that quickly leads us into classified territory, but I think it's the only sensible way to think about this capability requirement. On this issue, the 2009 White Paper tended to subscribe every possible role to the Collins replacement. And let me re remind you what that document said. It said, the future submarine will have greater range, longer endurance on patrol and expanded capabilities compared to the current Collins-class submarine. It will also be equipped with very secure real-time communications and be able to carry different mission payloads such as uninhabited uh, underwater vehicles. The future submarine will be capable of a range of tasks such as anti-ship and anti-submarine warfare, strategic strike, mine detection and mine laying operations, <coughs> intelligence collection, uh, supporting special forces 
and gathering battle space data in support of operations. If that sounds fantastic, um, it's because it is. Clearly, the more the government grapples with this set of specifications, the harder the task becomes. And I see no recourse to this other than to take a disciplined approach of thinking through what an Australia really needs in terms of capabilities. It's hard to buy um, an F-22 on a Cessna budget. The third rule of thumb is that the government should think about broad capabilities, not just platforms. The future submarine will be part of a broader force and a broader alliance structure. While our debate across all of defence tends to default to platforms, we all understand that success in military operations goes to those who can integrate capabilities into a fighting unit. So here the critical question is, how will the submarine fit into a broader Australian warfighting concept? How will it work with a range of other subsurface, surface and airborne systems? And how will these adapt to changing technological conditions over the life of the capability? My fourth rule of thumb is this. Look at alternatives to deliver capability outcomes. I'd suggest that one of the impacts of the 2009 white paper has been to keep us focused on 12 platforms. Looking at alternative options to deliver capability is an essential task, if only to persuade government that the original proposal is the correct one. For example, I think there is a need to think about strike options for the ADF that goes beyond the future submarine capability and which could conceivably suggest that there would be other ways to deliver standoff strike capability worth pursuing. In another area, the direction of US thinking as well as that of a number of sophisticated military powers is now moving more decisively towards wide varieties of uninhabited systems. So how might this change our submarine capability requirement 15 to 20 years from now? Somehow that has to be factored into the equation. My fifth rule of thumb is to ask, what are the alliance and regional implications? Now, my view is that the US alliance is becoming more, not less, important to Australia. That is underlined by the direction of, re of recent strategic developments in our broader region. A closer alliance creates both risks and opportunities for Australia. One risk is that the US will increasingly look to its allies to share more of the security burden. And the more roles Australia has undertaken and performed in the last 15 years, I would suggest, the more Washington expects that we should be able to do in our region and beyond. Now, the opportunities for Australia are also great. Apart from the well understood access of benefits to technology, intelligence and training, there's the not inconsiderable benefit of linking American interests much more directly to our own in terms of the stability and security of Southeast Asia. The 2009 White Paper makes it obvious that the submarine choice in a strategic, if not in an industry sense, is the one that has to be understood in terms of its impact on alliance, um, expectations and partnerships. That's one reason why we have such a strong uh, alliance presence, US presence at this meeting, and it obviously points to the importance the closest possible dialogue with the US. But there are also a, a range of regional and global partnership implications, as the Prime Minister's uh, visit to Japan has made clear. There's an obvious potential for Australia to strengthen some important relations with Japan and with a number of European players. There is an industry core to this, but also a broad strategic point as well about how Australia can use the submarine choice to strengthen key bilateral ties. Now, my sixth rule of thumb is that healthy scepticism is a virtue. Uh, some years ago, I worked for a respected Secretary of Defence, um, and very early in my tenure as a first assistant secretary, he advised me that a safe course of action was never to believe the first piece of advice that was offered in relation to any policy issue. Now, I came to learn the wisdom of those words, particularly, some might say, in relation to my own efforts at policy advice. This is not to attribute any fault, it's just a product of the enormous complexity of the issues under consideration, the absence of clear and definitive information, 
and the low risk appetite of governments when it comes to projects. Now, Clark Clausewitz talked about the fog of war, but a, a modern observer of defence could just as easily write about the fog of policy. It's an incredibly challenging business. How can ministers cope with this reality? Well, that's where the idea of healthy scepticism comes in. And some questions that come to mind include, well, what is the real basis for the number 12? Second is, is SLOC protection really a modern requirement? What do our allies really expect of us? All useful questions to ask. My second last rule of thumb is that it's important to remember also that there is a wider defence force. Uh, the scale of the submarine choice is so large that it does have the potential to crowd out other necessary acquisitions anticipated in the defence capability program. Much as the submarine capability is necessary, uh, it can't be allowed to turn the ADF into a one-trick pony. Now here I want to avoid recourse to the line that um, uh, I'm advancing a, an argument for a balanced force. A force I think can be unbalanced if it me meets the particular needs of a country. Um, that's why um, the Swiss don't have a navy. But no one would suggest that Australia can afford to underinvest in critical land and air systems and for that matter in the surface fleet. So further new investment areas, for example, as well, uh, in space and cyber are emerging. A sustainable submarine choice is one that allows the rest of the ADF to develop as well. And my final rule of thumb is that industry outcomes uh, should be sustainable, should be long-term and believable. Now, I think it reveals no secret to say that uh, industry has high expectations of an approach from government which enables them to make long-term plans and to stick with them. Just as for defence, the least useful situation for industry is one where there are, where there are rapid fluctuations in plans, major year-on-year -year changes to spending profiles and rapid redesigns of capability requirements. Now, everything I've heard from the Minister over the last seven months leads me to think that the government's intent is to produce this predictability and believably and believability in policy statements around the defence capability plan. Sustainability, of course, goes to questions of through life support, which is perhaps even more important than platform construction. And that will surely be a key to the success of the submarine choice. So ladies and gentlemen, I've offered you um, my eight rules of thumb for the submarine choice. And we'll see how many thumbs I have left at the end of the next two days. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for uh, kicking us off. Um, and can I now uh, introduce uh, Mr. Raiden Gates who will, from Lockheed Martin, who will introduce uh, the minister. Thanks, Ben. It's a uh, great honour for Lockheed Martin to uh, partner with ASPE uh, at this very important conference, and particularly on a topic that is so important to the capability of our defence force and of our nation. So it's my pleasure, my honour, to uh, introduce the newly re-elected Senator from Western Australia, and congratulations on that, sir. Um, in, the, uh, in the program, the uh, bio of the, uh, of the minister is there, a uh, lawyer of trade, 20 years in the back blocks of Western Australia, and uh, then was attracted to the broader canvas of politics and joined the Senate in 2002, rising now to his present position as uh, Minister for Defence. Uh, Minister, all in this room know your passion for the portfolio and for your dedication to the men and women who serve our nation and wear our uniform, and also your dedication to ensuring that they have the best equipment and best capability as they go forward. Yesterday, in uh, a, mes a pre joint media release that was came out on the Finals Coal Review, you were quoted as saying, the su Navy's submarine fleet is one of Australia's most strategically important capabilities. And I think on that segue, sir, I can only ask you to address this conference. Thank you. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make a few acknowledgements uh, in talking about this very important and interesting subject. Peter Jennings, Executive Director of ASPE, Stephen Loosley, the Chairman of ASPE, my Chief of Navy, Admiral Griggs, and CEO of DMO, Warren King. Can I also make particular mention of the Pacific Fleet Commander Harry Harris, lovely to see you here. You were uh, up in Jakarta with me two weeks ago and now you're down here in Canberra. Um, we've got to stop meeting like this. Um, His Excellency the German Ambassador, can I say uh, a welcome to you. Friends from uh, Singapore, I see here, of course, the United States, Gary Roughhead and, and others. Uh, France, particularly, thank you for coming. Germany, of course, I can see a uh, a, a large contingent of ThyssenKrupp personnel sitting up there, and of course the United Kingdom. Now I've probably forgotten the Japanese, yes I have, there's some Japanese people here and, and many others and, I, and who have travelled so far. I want to thank you for coming to what is for Australia a very important subject. Uh, I wish to acknowledge the sponsors because uh, you know, putting all this together does cost a lot of money, so to the prime sponsors Lockheed Martin and Telus, thank you for your commitment. Sponsors Northrop Grumman, Raytheon Australia and ThyssenKrupp, thank you for your commitment. Um, so I have a, a script which I have to stick to because this subject is so sensitive, so politically intense, that if I deviate one word here or there I'll be on the front page getting belted up by not just people out there but also my own team. So bear with me as I go through what is potentially a very carefully written speech. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. So good, so far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> and those of you who know me appreciate the strong interest I have in submarines. They are a highly potent asymmetric capability of strategic importance to our island nation. Their importance is unlikely to abate Rather, they will grow in significance as we see their acquisition expanding right across North and Southeast Asia. They're a critical element in our maritime security planning. I would like to thank the Australian Strategic Policy Institute for providing this opportunity to discuss the importance of our future submarine. And looking at the list of speakers you have, this is, uh, this is not to be missed. ASPE is a significant and valuable contributor to the national discussion on submarines in Australia and more broadly defence issues and indeed having been the shadow for uh, about five and a half years without ASPE I've got to tell you I would not know anything about this subject matter of any real worth. Uh, I would like to congratulate ASPE for the balanced way that they carry out their important work and the success that ASPE has enjoyed in getting the word out about submarines and more broadly defence issues in general. The Australian Government is acutely aware of the importance of having a highly capable submarine force, especially given the rapidly changing strategic circumstances in our region. Importantly, this year we celebrate the centenary of Australian submarines. It is a reminder that we have a need for a strong and enduring submarine capability in the Royal Australian Navy and we've had one since its inception 100 years ago. Since their introduction into Australian surface, service, the value of, capa of a capable submarine force to our nation has been clear, with no better example than the old AE-1 and AE-2. These submarines were among the very first defence capability plans for our Navy. They were a 750 tonne submarine ordered off the shelf from Britain in late 1910 and built in, of course, for many of you to un know and understand, Barrow in Finesse, which is... Barrow in Finesse is significant. I was there three weeks ago. It is the largest hematite deposit in the United Kingdom. And so that is why um, most of the mining equipment that I observed in my earlier days in the eastern goldfields of Western Australia had Barrow in Finesse printed on the side, of particularly the blocks to a lot of steam-powered engines and things. I thought it was actually a brand name until I realised it was a small town that I've finally had the pleasure of visiting, as I say, three weeks ago. Um, while I was there, I saw uh, quite an amazing defence capability. Britain's, the UK's astute class submarine is a wonder to behold. 
At 7,400 tonnes, this attack submarine is a great monument to the technological skill and know-how of the United Kingdom. Um, I was aboard uh, HMS Artful and I thank Philip Hammond for allowing me to go on board um, their most uh, critical and important strategic deterrent capability. HMS Artful, the third of the uh, five boats I think it is to be built in this program. And uh, I saw um, Talus's flank array in its various evolutions with the latest technology of uh, paper-thin material on the side, uh, a lot of the components built in Rydalmere. Uh, this is a really, truly wonderful piece of uh, defence technology. Um, and then I return you back to AE1 and AE2. The comparison could not be more stark. The range and endurance of those first submarines, they were E-class submarines, was the largest uh, and, the, and they were the most modern submarines of their day. We deployed them very quickly to areas of opera, operation um, in around Rabaul, where we lost, unfortunately, AE1. And then, of course, having towed them all the way out to Australia, we towed AE2 back to um, Egypt and then on to, as I say, uh, on to Gallipoli. Um, AE2 was, of course, the first submarine to penetrate the Dardanelles Straits on Anzac Day uh, in 1915 um, and getting into the sea, sea of Mamora, her orders were to generally run amok. Um, under the command of Lieutenant Commander Henry Hugh Gordon Dacre Stoker, um, she was able to achieve her mission and uh, set about the task of disrupting the Turkish Navy in the Sea of Mamora. I'm a little bit dirty on the fact that he was first in and didn't get a VC and the two Brits that followed him, the skippers of those two submarines, did get VCs. Um, that is an enduring cause of, uh, of consternation to me. Importantly, Hamilton uh, was made aware of the penetration, which was the only good news I think that he heard during the campaign. Uh, the achievement spread to the diggers clinging onto the cliffs at Gallipoli. Um, a notice was st stuck onto a shell-shattered stump on the hillside that read, Australian sub AE2 just through the Dardanelles advance Australia. Um, th that is a, a, a really tremendous feat considering that for almost 16 hours that little 750 tonne submarine sat at about 90, in 90 feet of water on the bottom waiting for the, uh, the, the surface ships to, uh, to abate with their grappling hooks and other rudimentary anti-submarine warfare capabilities. Um, may I say that our subsurface skills and our heritage in submarines was forged through the efforts of AE2 way back then. From then until the 1930s, Australia continued to operate large British ocean-going submarines periodically with varying degrees of success and, of course, with some considerable difficulty. By the coming of World War II, we were without submarines and relied upon many of our allied nations to operate out of Australia uh, in the Pacific theatre. Of course, the British, mainly the US, and significantly the Dutch. The government made a strategic decision in 1963 to purchase and enter into service six military off-the-shelf Oberon-class submarines to re-establish our submarine force. The first of the six, HMS Oxley, was commissioned in 1968. The last, Otama, was commissioned in 1978. These were very capable boats and they formed the foundation of our submarine capability, that the submarine capability we have today. The O-boats, with their long range and high endurance, confirmed the role that our submarines could fulfil as a strategic defence asset with the capacity to deter as well as to respond to aggression. Through them, and in the 40 years or so since their introduction into service, we have learned many lessons, some hard, some expensive, but all extremely valuable. Australia's Navy became a competent submarine operator and maintainer through the Oberons. We learned enough to give us the confidence to undertake the Collins-class submarine build program. We have grown the ability to maintain and operate a complex and demanding platform like a submarine. The build and sustainment of Collins has been an enormous challenge for Australia as a nation. 
and despite its well-documented problems, the achievements of this program and class often get forgotten. We built and delivered six submarines over a construction period from 1990 to 2003. Our build quality was equal to and also exceeded the quality of sections of the first submarine that were built overseas. The build of Collins also overlapped the construction of the Anzac class frigates. This program was marked by a world class performance in terms of build quality, cost and schedule, that's the Anzacs, and demonstrated that we could manage two major maritime construction programs in Australia concurrently and deliver quality vessels. So enough about the history of where we are today. Our election commitment was to make a decision on our future submarines within 18 months of being elected. Now, no one should underestimate the priority that I am giving to C1000. In opposition, I spent a significant amount of effort shining the light, is an interesting expression, shining the light, as I am told to say to you, uh, at Senate estimates on our deeply troubled submarine capability. The political pressure applied undoubtedly served as a catalyst for the Gillard government to give the submarine force its due regard. After four years of inactivity which saw our submarine availability fall away to alarming levels, the Collins Review led by John Coles was commissioned by the previous government, and I congratulate them roundly for doing that, uh, and the outcome of that review has seen a significant improvement in submarine availability. And I'll have a little more to say about this a little later. Um, in the lead up to the last election, I gave my support to Defence's chartered course for the future submarine program. The suspension of investigations into option one, an existing off the shelf design, uh, and option two, an existing off the shelf design modified to incorporate Australia's specific requirements with respect to combat system and weapons and more detailed investigation of option three, an evolved design that enhances the capabilities of existing off-the-shelf designs, including Collins, and option four, a bespoke new design. So we're left with options three and four at this particular time. It is always difficult for a shadow minister to, to gain a full appreciation on defence planning on account of the necessity for secrecy, and of course the government doesn't want to help the opposition in any shape, state or form. And as such, I placed a caveat on my support and said at the defence debate in Adelaide prior to the last election, if anything the minister has said is based on fantasy, we'll tell you and we'll revisit this. I have now had extensive discussions with defence and access to a range of information previously denied to me. Notwithstanding all of that, I am still coming to terms with the complexities of the intellectual property issues and our imperative to have sovereign control and proprietorship of whatever we build. As a government, we want, to both, we want both low risk and high levels of capability for the Australian Defence Force in its submarine uh, force element group. While such desires are not mutually exclusive, that is the balance between uh, risk and, and capability, the resolution and attainment of a viable balance between competing imperatives is a highly complex and perpetual battle. Typically, and usually, we would seek to achieve uh, our acquisition through a military off-the-shelf uh, purchase. Um, but of course, as you all know, submarines are not a typical acquisition. The balance between risk, capability and costs is a, a tough and difficult one. And not surprisingly, different areas of defence, government and industry have very different perspectives on how to achieve that balance. It's fair to say that I am uh, and defence is still working very aggressively on that problem. A submarine design and build is one of the most complicated engineering projects a nation can undertake. And some of the more experienced countries that do export and build submarines as a matter of course have experienced uh, the full gamut of uh, difficulties in various iterations of some designs. My experience at Barrow in Finesse highlighted to me the enormity of such a task hundreds of design and build engineers and the complexity of a modern submarine design and the cutting edge construction processes as a national asset was indeed impressive. Nevertheless, Australia did achieve something similar in the Collins submarine build program. The question is, can we repeat such success, uh, avoiding some of the technical and commercial issues that plagued Collins? In truth, our requirements uh, are probably 
far, far more complex than ever Collins was. Uh, you know, ideally, we are seeking a, a comparable capability to a nuclear submarine with an, a diesel electric motors inside. It should be evident that our approach to our future submarine acquisition needs to be more comprehensive than just the introduction of a submarine. Uh, there are four primary objectives for the future submarine enterprise that I can identify, and these are firstly to deliver an enduring, regionally dominant, superior conventional submarine capability. Ensure that our new submarine capability is affordable, and that is a very important part of the whole program. To ensure Australia is able to sustain a superior conventional submarine capability into the foreseeable future in a cost-effective way and to avoid, of course, a submarine capability gap. So let me deal with each of those four issues um, separately. Firstly, to have a regionally superior and dominant conventional future submarine capability. I have used specifically the term submarine capability rather than just submarine for good reason. Our future submarine will be part of a larger ADF and defence structure and often allied suite of capabilities and enablers. Satellite communications, surveillance, off-board sensors, logistics and even our ability to support our submarines on operations and sustain them through life must all be factors, uh, fact factored into our thinking about the future submarine capability. To have the regionally superior and dominant capability that we want, we must meet two specific tests. We must be capable of operating independently over the large distances of our maritime region and stay on station sufficiently long to safely fulfil its mission, so that we will need to break new ground on our indiscretion ratio. It must be capable of undertaking its missions clandestinely and be capable of destroying other submarines and surface vessels. To a large extent, the United States and the United Kingdom are world leaders in a number of these areas and continuing these, the close relationships we have with those two countries is at the very heart of our future aspirations. Our ability to access such technologies is not a simple undertaking and relies on our ability to sustain a trusted relationship with these critical partners at levels of government to government, Navy to Navy and across industries. Now secondly, I said that we should ensure that the submarine capability is affordable. We do need a highly effective capability but not at any cost. It is critical that we maintain the affordability of the future submarine capability both in construction and sustainment. And let's not forget that Collins was sold to us as being very cheap to sustain and very reliable. To do this, we need to carefully manage our aspirations and we will need to make many compromises along the way. A key element of this is to minimise the degree of risk, as you all know. I have fully endorsed a list of key principles for the future submarine project and, the, and they include the following. Defence must maximise the use of proven technology. Defence must maintain, and let me pause to say that we are seeing an evolution in AIP at the moment, particularly in Europe, that is quite problematic. The, the technology is, is on the developmental side and causing a fair bit of problems in that regard. Defence must maintain strict control of requirements. Defence must engage an appropriately experienced design house. Defence must utilise appropriately qualified and experienced personnel. And lessons learned from the initial Collins and similar programs should not be forgotten. Now I know that Navy is committed to this path. The DMO has stood up C1000 program office and its IPT with these tenants as foundation stones. As I have said on other occasions, and it is clear from our election commitment, the Coalition intends that the ADF be equipped and sustained by Australian services and equipment wherever possible. We have also committed to ensure that work in Australia on the replacement of the current submarine fleet will be centred around the South Australian shipyards. As a government, we want to give Australian industry every possible chance of success. 
As the Prime Minister said very clearly prior to the September election, we have also committed to ensure that work in Australia on the replacement of the current submarine fleet will be centred around the South Australian shipyards. But he also said, and I want to quote him, we make decisions on the basis of defence imperatives, not on the basis of industry assistance imperatives or regional assistance imperatives. As a government, we want to give Australian industry every chance of success, as I have said. But let me be very, very clear. Our primary and dominant purpose is to ensure that we provide Navy with a submarine which meets its requirements. A submarine is not industrial or regional policy by other means or another name. Industry must dem demonstrate an ongoing capacity to meet international benchmarks with respect to productivity, a word that I often don't hear around the place in terms of um, particularly um, large construction tasks, cost and schedule. We see military shipbuilding as a strategically important industry and certainly it is desirable that the new submarine would be built in Australia but may I say and underline, it is not a blank cheque. I've agreed that Defence actively and formally engage key industry sectors to ensure that we have the best information on these and related submarine construction issues. This engagement will have the purpose of ensuring that Defence is able to act as an intelligent and informed customer and to explore an appropriate industry structure to support the delivery of the future submarine capability. In addition, we also need a highly skilled workforce built on the experience we have gained in sustaining and upgrading the Collins-class submarine and building the air warfare destroyers and the superstructures to the LHDs. Our work here must also bring together the related education and training programs that we need to grow and sustain for our workforce to be a viable, intelligent workforce in this space over the next few decades. My recent visit to the UK shipyards, and I was at Rosyth, uh, then over to Glasgow, then down to Barrow in Furness, clearly demonstrated to me the issues associated with a green labour force being stood up to construct the Astute program. Uh, it is now a world-class program and, a, and a, as I've said, an outstanding submarine, but it took a lot of time and, may I say, an enormous amount of pain to get to the level they are today because they had stopped construction of submarines. Now thirdly, our task is to ensure that we are able to sustain a superior and dominant conventional submarine capability into the foreseeable future. At this point we believe that submarines will remain relevant for the foreseeable future, although we cannot rule out the possibility of some disruptive technologies. Consequently, the enterprise not only needs to be capable of introducing the new submarine, it must sustain the future submarine capability at the edge. From a design perspective, I believe at the very least we need to be capable of two key things. Firstly, we need to have sufficient access and knowledge to exercise sovereign design control over capabilities necessary to maintain a regionally superior conventional submarine capability into the future and taking account of our desire for ongoing access to U US and UK technologies. In other words, we need to be uh, the authors and commanders of our own destiny with respect to intellectual property in this space. We must have proprietorship of such intellectual property. Secondly, we need to have sufficient knowledge and expertise to exercise our responsibilities under workplace health and safety law. Now this is a very important injection into the process. Submarine rescue is at the forefront of my considerations all the time, all the time. And so as we go forward with new submarines, we will factor and we are factoring and the IPT is very importantly and impressively factoring workplace health and safety uh, issues into everything we do. We need to be capable of materially maintaining our submarines into the future, including undertaking full cycle dockings. In parallel with this, we need to ensure that we maintain appropriate investment in science, technology, uh, as we continue to push the boundaries of our own knowledge of submarine operations. And you all know that the way we conduct our operations is very, very much different to most of the other players in the space. To avoid a gap, lastly, to deal with the gap. 
and I'm mindful of the gap. To avoid the gap, we really need two things to happen. Firstly, we need to maintain the Collins as, regionally, as a regionally capable submarine. That is, operationally effective probably beyond its original design life, and secondly, we need to introduce our future submarine into our order of battle by the early mid-2030s at the latest. At this stage, we are not aware of any specific issue, and this is important, that any specific issue that might prevent the life of the Collins being extended, but I think we would be wise to retain some healthy degree of caution until this is confirmed by much more detailed work. We've already done some work, and there are no deal breakers that are evident to us at this time. The Collins was originally designed for a life of about 28 years, although we have now moved to a 30-year life cycle. So this means that HMAS Farncombe, which was commissioned in 1998, might be expected to remain in service until about 2027. However, we are planning to extend the Collins class for a further five or six years through another full cycle docking. This would take Farncombe out to 2033. This will mean Farncombe and the rest of the Collins class will be 10 years older than the Oberon class when they retired, and, and it is the equivalent of operating good old AE1 out to the end of World War II. I'm led to understand that if we were to get our own design developed by one of the major international design houses, it would take at least eight years from selection of that design concept to the cutting of the steel. Noting that it is now 2014, this means we are already pretty well much against the wall in terms of this critical path schedule. The government needs to understand how long we should expect the design and build process to take, what alternatives there are to accelerate such a process, and are there other ways to introduce the future submarine that will allow the evolution of our aspiration without a gap and without undue risk. The previous government did develop the integrated project team with the intention that it be able to advise government as an informed customer on the way forward for this vital program. I still do not know what the potential costs of a new design submarine or an evolved Collins submarine might be, and I'm very concerned about that. Furthermore, I'm advised that the former government removed millions from the front of the submarine program uh, and it remained right up to September last year, unclear as to how they proposed to deliver and pay for this program, uh, like so many of the other defence programs that they talked about. There has been a lot of speculation about whether we need 12 boats. Let me be clear on this subject. My primary focus is not about numbers, but on the capability and availability of boats required to meet the tasks set by government. As part of the white paper process, we will re-examine the strategic objectives of the future submarine program, including operational concepts, the number of submarines required at sea, and therefore the total number of submarines. So where does this lead us to? I propose to take to government this year, in support of the white paper, a plan that balances up cost, capability and risk. I'm closely engaged in this program and the resolu resolutions I take to my colleagues will of necessity provide assurance that there will be no capability gap and that we will deliver a regionally superior, superior and dominant affordable conventional submarine capability, sustainable in Australia over the foreseeable future. The full details of this will be outlined in concert with the delivery of our new white paper. Today I also released the findings of the Coles Review Stage four, where John and his team took a deep look at what progress has been made in implementing his recommendations as were set out in Coles 1. I'm very pleased with the way Navy, DMO and the Australian Submarine Corporation in Adelaide have pulled together to create the kind of change that we have recently observed in Collins' availability. When I was briefed by John Coles, I, I personally spoke with a range of personnel after he had told me of the success of following his guidelines and recommendations to get our availability back, I rang all of the concerned personnel and thanked them for their efforts because the change has been, to use John Coles's words, remarkable. I'm hopeful that the change we have seen in performance around the Collins can be translated across to the air warfare program. The most encouraging piece 
from John's report, which was also potentially the most troubling, was that between October 2009 and February 2010, we were effectively without any submarine capability. Against a three-boat availability indice, we had 0% availability. On the two-boat availability indice, we had about 7% availability. We were in a very dire, and may I say, a very dark place. Against this, in 2007, the two-boat availability was 90%. Something was going seriously wrong, and the previous government did very little in the first three years but wring its hands in despair. It wasn't until July 2011, and after four years of questioning and badgering from the opposition, that the previous government did something constructive to critically examine this issue and appointed John Coles and his team to look at what was now a very troubled uh, availability program coming from Collins. We are heavily indebted to John Coles and his team for their outstanding work and to the men and women of the submarine enterprise, and I'm using that expression as, a, as I have been taught to by John Coles, submarine enterprise for their truly remarkable efforts. Through the Collins Transformation Program, guided by the recommendations of Mr Coles and his team, our submarine availability in December 2012 grew back to 60%. Today it is back to the 2007 level of 90%. John also found that progress towards achieving benchmark performance is equally impressive. From mid-2014, none of the Collins-class submarines will be in the old 8 plus 3 operating cycle and are progressively moving into a new 10 plus 2 operating cycle of 10 years in service, followed by a 24-month or two-year full cycle docking. This change to the operating cycle is a prerequisite to reach and maintain benchmark availability. Once in the 10 plus 2 usage and upkeep cycle, steady state, time in maintenance will significantly reduce. To achieve this, planned maintenance is being comprehensively restructured while ensuring that the design intent of the submarine is assured. The two-year full cycle docking re requires compressing the previous overhaul time by a factor of nearly two. This is the word of caution and provides a benchmark of achievement or not. So we will know by 2017 whether we are on track to be a realistic uh, player in the space. We must achieve the 24-month full cycle docking. The first two-year full cycle docking commences in July of this year and uh, John has ascertained that preparations are well advanced. New facilities projects funded by the Australian Submarine Corporation, improved working practices and maintenance and material supply routines are collectively designed to deliver the required efficiency improvements. The capital projects are nearly uh, nearing their completion and some process improvements have been trialled and verified on extant programs. John Coles optimistically cautions that the two-year full cycle docking should be able to be achieved and notes that the right initiatives to achieve it are being undertaken but many are untried. There remains more than routine risk to be managed to achieve HMAS Farncombe's scheduled end date for its docking. If this full cycle docking can be achieved within the 24 month period, then I think we can say that we are getting there. In summary, I want to agree with what John has said when he says that he has seen a lot to be admired in what is a remarkable transformation. Much has been achieved in a very short time, leading to improved availability which is on track to reach the international benchmark in, as I say, financial year 17. Ensuring personnel with the required skill sets in the breadth and depth necessary for defence to discharge its more limited but essential roles and responsibilities will be extremely important to the ongoing progress of the transformation program. Now the signs are, as I say, encouraging, but the risks are still there um, as we go forward with more work, much more work needing to be done. We must remember that the Collins class is a sophisticated platform which operates in an extremely demanding environment and continued improvements in availability will lack resilience until the Coles recommendations are fully implemented. We cannot take our foot off the accelerator for a split second. But what has been achieved to date is remarkable, delivering a level of performance that would not have been viewed as possible two years ago. 
it has been most gratifying to see the astonishing turnaround of a seriously failing program to one that should within two years achieve, or better, international benchmark performance. Now, in conclusion, I would say that I am more optimistic today about our submarine fleet than I, of course, was seven months ago. I must mention how impressed I am with the dedicated and professional men and women in our submarines. They are doing amazing things in what are becoming once again reliable and technologically advanced boats and I commend them for having gone some distance themselves in restoring this vital capability. Now the future submarine is clearly one of our most important and vital strategic capabilities. It's certainly our most difficult. Our quest to provide a boat which fulfils our future needs is a very arduous and challenging one but one which I and the government will approach with the same level of commitment, determination and focus that we see in our submariners every single day. Thank you. Prime Minister, if you would uh, stay at the podium. Thank you very much for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we ought not to... Uh, uh, lose the opportunity to uh, ask some questions of the Minister. Uh, can I ask you to uh, identify yourself by uh, name and affiliation? Um, and um, probably worth saying, uh, even, even though it's pretty obvious by the uh, number of cameras in the room, that this is, of course, uh, an, open, an open conference. Um, I'm also st I'm struggling a bit with the glare of the lights, so you may have to wave uh, fairly vigorously for me to see you. But uh, a, a, question, a question here, and then we'll go over for a second one on that side of the room. So starting here, please. I've got two journalists putting their hands straight up. I'll tell you, you guys are good. Well, at 4,200 submerged tonnes, Japan has the biggest and I think most capable conventionally powered submarine in the world. We once had it with Collins, but now the Soryu class is out there. The three two or three Kawasaki, I think they're V8 motors on board, really do interest me, as I've said in the past. Um, but that's just a particular part of what we are focused on, and, and you know, I'm keen to progress our our discussions with Japan as best I can and I think Minister Onodir is coming down to see me in the next couple of weeks. Um, but the really important stuff is that the US particularly and the UK have got really outstanding but very, very much crown jewel capability in this space. Now, we need to engage them, we need to show them what we do in terms of the way we operate our submarines, you know, shallow, hot water, living in the layer, that sort of stuff, to see if they can see it clear to have the confidence to assist us with a lot of their technical capability um, into the future. So we, we very respectfully go about the task of engaging, um, you know, Philip Hammond from my point of view, Chuck Hagel from my point of view, and, and uh, asking them, you know, here's our program, here's what the space we want to be in, can you assist us? And so we, we're doing that as rapidly and as carefully as we can because it's really important. They are our allies. I think they have, and I need to convince them, they have a vested interest in seeing us do well in what we do with submarines. So, you know, um, the Japanese, of course, are very important and they have achieved the physics of pushing a 4,200 tonne submerged vessel through the water with diesel electric power. And, and we need to learn from that. David. Sure. 
Thank you for that question. It's a very important one. I'm not going to speculate on whether Australian defence industry can or can't meet the challenge or what we will do if they can't. The White Paper will deal with these issues and we're in the process right now of trying to resolve them. But all I'm saying to defence industry is, ladies and gentlemen, this is an opportunity for you. You need to show us that you can be cost effective, that you can meet schedule and that you can meet the, 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 the cutting edge technological and complex challenges in probably after the Lucas Heights reactor, our most technically significant scientific artefact, a submarine. Now I'm saying to them, you know, if you want to play in the space, you've got to show us that you can do it technically skillfully but cost effectively. There's no free lunch in this. Take one last question from Brendan. Brendan, another journalist. No, I'm not, but I'm, I'm working through what we've been bequeathed by the previous government, three and four. Now, you know, that there's good reasons why those options were left on the table. Um, you know, our requirement is, is very, very much different to um, European and even Japanese requirements. And so we were seeking to meet those requirements through leaving those two options as the most risk averse to meet our requirements on the table. Now, um, we're progressing number three. There are some issues with that. And of course, a bespoke design is, is you know, we will need to engage a design house. We will need to undertake substantial work in option four, which is, which is, may I say, is ongoing right now. But, but a 2,000 tonne submarine does not fulfil our purpose. It just simply won't give us the options we must have. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a 60 second break in place to change personnel up here. Can I ask you to please thank the Minister for Defence?